Welcome to the ANZ Business Leader Boardroom Series. In this next webisode, Frontrunner Consulting's Doug Maitland, together with some of WA's elite business writers, will discuss and share insights related to fraud and compliance management. From sophisticated organised criminal activity to the seemingly more benign falsification of individual income by borrowers, fraud is a major concern. Over the next 20 minutes, we'll help you understand how to successfully manage your fraud and compliance requirements. So let's get started. Download your workbook now. You'll find the link for your workbook under this video. And then follow along with this webisode as we guide you through your compliance and fraud management. There'll be times throughout the webisode where you'll be required to fill in your workbook. So make sure you pause the video and give yourself plenty of time to complete the tasks properly. If you do that, then at the end you should have all the tools you need to manage your fraud and compliance requirements effectively under the new legislation. In addition, you'll also receive two CPD points, which we'll give you the code for at the end of the webisode. Throughout this, you'll hear from a lot of different people with various insights. To get the most value, always be thinking about how the information provided can apply to your business. Before you can understand how to manage your fraud and compliance requirements, you must first understand what your requirements are. Well, let's start with websites. Who checks the content of your website? Who keeps things up to date? We have had it checked for compliance, uh, but actually updating it, you know, it's probably my job, but I don't have enough time to do that. Yeah, we, we employ a, um, a marketing specialist group that's, that's within the finance industry that provides a lot of, uh, a lot of work, a lot of information for us to place on the site. Um, besides that, updated news articles and such are, are placed on there by my staff so at my direction. Uh, my aggregator actually has a compliance manager there, so we, we audit ourselves every three months and, uh, and part of that's looking over the website. That's the, the purpose of today's topic is to actually see compliance as being part of your overall business as, as distinct from compliance being a standalone mm. part of your business. And so having a website that is compliant also means having a website that is current and having a website that's topical for your clients. And so um, having a compliant website is, is actually one and the same as having a website that is effective in terms of marketing your business. Just to add on to what um, Kiran has said, it's also just making sure that whatever um, is in there is actually current. So if you've had information there for two years, um, it might be misleading just because that information is um, outdated. So it's just having that practice of um, ensuring that um, whatever you have on your website or um, whatever information you've probably provided out there um, is up to date, is still current and is still compliant. Does everyone have um, an unsubscribe option at least for for their clients um, you see them everyone does it's something to be, to be mindful of I can see the challenge in terms of um, just building the time to actually track how you um, you know manage your unsubscribe list things with um, your, your against your client listing and who needs to get what from a client um, perspective we use um AFG for all of our marketing um, we are members of the spark program which is their CRM which other people are probably using as well. And, and we don't do a great deal of marketing outside of that because we, um, we have confidence in them that they're compliant. So we don't run the risks of trying to do something outside. Um, social media is probably another conversation um, and where some of our individual brokers have set up their own social media business pages and so on. That's probably where our main concern comes from. Make sure the messages are compliant. We're also part of the AFG group and therefore um, we also participate in the SMART program. And interestingly enough, some of the feedback from our clients being that we're not the only one that gives them the announcement about the interest rate changes, that now they're getting one from their financial planner and their accountant and their real estate agent. So they're getting somewhat inundated by these in a quarterly newsletter. So even though our, our actual database is very sticky and we have a very low level of attrition in terms of losing clients, extremely low, nevertheless, we've actually had quite a few clients who've unsubscribed and have just let us know and sort of almost apologised for it. But just that, you know, we already get these and they're very similar and thanks, but, you know, we're okay to stay in touch without it. So it's interesting. It's, it's yeah, there's, there's a lot of information that's coming through to people via um, their emails and there is somewhat of an overlap. I notice I get the same newsletter that I send to my clients from the odd sorts out there, which is, you know, almost identical. You know, having been back in the industry for three months, um, I'm quite happy to say that the, the evolution of the aggregator groups, uh, I think, has been a real positive one. And um, the aggregators are providing great value, I believe, for the broker groups. Um, 
the, you know, when I talk to the aggregators, they, they'll, they'll actually say that they, they put a lot of effort and work into um, providing a lot of this marketing, but, but not all of the brokers take it up. And I'd sort of recommend that um, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. There's been a lot of work, a lot of compliance has been done to, to help. And actually taking advantage of that and personalising it for your own use. But, but then you're moving your compliance discussion from being compliant around the legal ease of the, of the marketing to being compliant around regularly contacting your clients, regularly contacting your referrers, and, and actually moving it from being a legal compliance to being a, a disciplined sales approach. As you can see, there are a lot of areas within a business that need to be constantly managed and reviewed. Pause this video now and take the time to think about how the various areas in your business could stand to be reviewed and managed more carefully. Now that you've acknowledged which areas of your business require constant review, the next thing you must do is consider how you can manage these areas. We tend to do a database clean every two years, so either we do it or within the company or we can outsource that. So it's emails, phone numbers, addresses, whatever, we can clean the database and then it means that I'm not calling a whole bunch of people um, and not, either not getting through to them means that I can call direct and know that I'm going to get through to the people and they want to talk to me. They don't want to receive marketing messages, they want to talk to me. We recently critiqued what we did from a marketing perspective with um, we were sending out an annual calendar, um, so we rang 200 of our clients to find out what they thought of our newsletter, what they thought of the calendar, and surprisingly probably 10% of people kept the calendar, because people use electronic calendars or mediums nowadays, so there's a lot of money obviously in producing mm. a, a calendar and posting it, um, so that, that was you know an eye-opener for us. Um, so we then decided to, to invest the money elsewhere, like a Christmas present, you know, something for nothing. Um, to give them something in the mail that they could unwrap. One of my questions in regards to that, we talk about unsubscribe, but definitely on my letter I don't actually say at the moment, do you still want to be on our mailing list? Is that something I should be doing? Grace. <laughs> we, should, we, should, um, we should give customers the, um, the option. option to opt out. Yeah. Mm. So I'd, I'd probably put something in the newsletter saying, you know, if you want to opt out, then contact us. Mm. Yeah, probably manage it that way. Yeah. Is that any time you send a, a marketing letter that you should have a clause down the bottom saying, if you, you don't want to receive yeah, marketing, you should. can you let us know by email or something like that? You or? should give them the option to opt out, unless it's um, just a servicing um, contact. So, for example, if you're if you're if you're contacting someone with regard to um, providing a service within an existing lending, then or even say, for example, Telstra is approaching a customer needs with regard to pro um, providing a service pro proposition within the existing contract, then they probably don't have to. But it's, if it's purely marketing, then I think you should. In a rising interest rate market, very commonly I see brokers um, messaging going out saying to clients, should you fix or should you not? And there's a suggestion that people might want to think about fixing rates when interest rates are rising. Um, what should we be mindful of in, in that situation to avoid obviously giving advice um, or fi financial advice around that? You probably would, of course, be telling them to think about um, whether to fix or not to fix, but it's more, um, you know, in situations where you're probably giving your view as to in which direction the interest rates are heading. Um, so, you know, the kind of communication you would be giving would be more general and not really saying, I believe or I know for a fact that this is where this is going, which I believe is not what happens, but um, you'd be more conscious in that in that kind of conversation, yeah. Even throwaway lines, which I sometimes see, and, and my history has been, you know, largely corporate and commercial banking, and, and I've always been very strong that our, our role is to give clients choice. Our role is never to make decisions for clients, and it's there's some subtle but really important differences with that. And, and I sort of cringe sometimes, even with, even with throwaway comments, which say things like, you know, we're at the bottom of the market, we're in a rising market, even those are fraught with danger because you're actually predicting um, yield curves and that's really hard to do. It's certainly from a business perspective you hear a lot of business being done through through social media. Can I get a sense of how many people actually have a company page that's on a social media site like in Facebook, these yeah. types of things? Yeah. Is there any rules around compliance that we know of? 
in the social media space, other than not giving false or misleading statements, not harassing people to do business with you and not turning up to people's houses uninvited to do business with regulated loans. For us, social media would be more about um, just giving some information every now and then about what's happening in the industry, uh, that sort of stuff, and just sort of maybe fun things, you know, things that are happening in the office and, you know, uh, with staff, that sort of thing. I don't use mine a lot, but I do put all the Reserve Bank announcements and things like that on there. Yeah. I don't send out the interest rate, <coughs> excuse me, the interest rate emails because I get six myself. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't do that, but I think I could use it in a better way. Um, How do you think you could use it? Well, I think there's room there to put a lot of information up there that would help clients uh, and perhaps uh, I suppose position yourself as an expert so then they'll contact you, you know, about getting that home loan or that investment loan and that's what I'd like to do. Yeah, you know, I use mine quite often and, and uh, what Kieran was saying earlier, um, the, ca the, the conversation on Facebook is generally a lot more casual so we really have to be mindful about making comments on industry and, and what's happening. So. Uh, a lot of the time, um, it's more just to be top of mind without being that best that pops up every few days. But it might just be something, um, you know, a bank's released a, a, a certain product, um, or there's a new policy in terms of genuine savings. So we try to keep it quite factual and, and just be there as the experts. Um, uh, we don't, we put up obviously the rate um, advertisements and um, just a relevant industry stats, so with uh, the number of properties on the market in WA, we have a report on that every week. Um, we use customer surveys um, from the get back from the aggregator to put up there, so. When you actually own the page on Facebook, you're also responsible for the posts that are put in there by um, your followers. So it's just making sure that if you believe a certain post that's been um, put on your, on your page is not appropriate, then just um, taking it off because then the responsibility might extend to you. Referrers are promoting Amanda's business and many others' business in this room. What they say, is there some risk areas there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they have to sign off um, to say that they refer business to me. We have yeah. to hold that on our compliance file yeah. um, as part of what we do. Um, also, if they are receiving a benefit from us in any way, shape or form, yeah. they have to declare that to the client at the time yeah. um, and get permission in what format that they're going to provide that information. Well, either they're going to give us the client's number or that the client will contact us. We get a number of quotes from seven agents on behalf of the client and then that seven agent that the client utilises, actually their document disclosure statement says that we will earn a benefit. But we don't receive a portion of the fee, they're just referring to the fact that when the loan settles, we'll be paid the commissions we will by bank. So that the client gets the impression from the correspondence mm. that we're getting a kickback from having referred them to that seven agent. And yet they were our client before they became the seven agent's client. I use it to my advantage. I don't pay any referrers, yeah. and uh, and and they don't take any money from me, and I don't give any money to them, but still have a referrer agreement. Uh, but I use that to advantage my customers. So look, you know, I deal with them, and they deal with me because we're both reputable yeah, operators. Exactly. exactly. And I think clients like to hear that yeah. at the end of the day. And we actually have all the people that we have a referral arrangement with bring down for the client to sign. So it's pretty much every real estate agent, specifically the settlement agents, the pest controls, all the, all of them that they all deal with and they all have noted, we have noted on a piece of paper and we say to the client, we just need to sign this as acknowledgement that we have relationships with all of these people um, and you can use whichever one of them you like or whoever you don't want to use, that's your choice. As you can see, the key is to stay on top of any compliance concerns. Manage and review your website or CNA on a regular basis to ensure these business areas are up to date. Pause this video now and take the time to establish a compliance management strategy. Will you update your website on a monthly basis or outsource this task altogether? Have a think about it. Just as compliance reviews are an integral part of a broker's role, so too is fraud management. As a broker, it is crucial you don't fall victim to fraudulent activity, as this can jeopardise more than your job. You know, fraud's a broad, broad scope and, you know, over, over time there has always been fraud. Wherever there is money, there is always fraud. And fraudsters are particularly good at a couple of scenarios. They are very good at finding loopholes in systems, and hence we've spent a fair bit of time talking about good systems. 
Forces are very good at finding the weak spot in the system. And they're also very good at utilising other people's credibility. Uh, they're very good at putting themselves in a position of trust and then taking advantage of that. And, and they use that trust and credibility as another way of breaching the system. We see um, false employment declarations. We see false, um, we see false group certificates. We see um, fictional employer names. Uh, we come across you know the whole gambit and. And pleasingly, um, uh, you know, at ANZ we have a team that, that look at this and pleasingly it's a very small team because they are, um, they are in, uh, um, you know, it's a small number, but you know, they still try. Um, the other way where you, where you see fraud is where people will attempt to get loans approved that really shouldn't be approved. And so, you know, some people will go in, go in with good intent and say, well, I'm going to help this person get a loan. But, you know, if they can't afford the loan, they can't afford the loan. And, you know, falsifying information, overlooking information, it's fraught with danger. And just a, a little word of caution for brokers is that, you know, everyone in this room is, is very aware of compliance and the risk and, um, you know, brokers have a lot at stake in reputation. So, you know, we do see from time to time um, referral sources are, are an area where, um, you know, the, the referrer doesn't have the same rigour and, uh, you know, brokers just need to be aware that, you know, the referral source is actually using the broker's credibility and the broker's knowledge to get deals through. So just, just to be, uh, you know, have your eyes open. The biggest risk for us as a, as a group is with the referral partners and certainly with our business. And given our close link to the real estate company, um, there's often pressure on, uh, they might have had a house that's been hanging around for a while, they're trying to sell it. They present someone and then we see them and uh, you know, I've personally walked away from um, a loan last week that um, you know, from my point of view um, they shouldn't get finance. I'm sure they can walk in somewhere else and be able to get finance if that person isn't doing the right thing but going back and um, explaining to the referral partner why we'd stepped away from that loan um, was important. And when we put the shoe on the other foot and said if it was your triannual or your licence and you were asking to um, you know, not put RCDs on the contract or something like that, would you do it? And the obvious answer is no, they won't. So why ask you me to do the same thing? Had one recently with one of our brokers where it was an existing client, husband and wife, um, and they came back for a top up, um, or he came back for a top up, and all the, the application was taken, etc. And then at the loan documentation stage, she wasn't available. Um, his excuse was that she had something to attend to with the children, uh, but she knew nothing about the top up. So he signed the documents um, and gave them back to the company. Um, we have a policy whereby you have to speak to all the applicants. So when the broker rang to speak to the, the second applicant, she knew nothing about it. So it was stopped before it actually became yeah. um, a fraud. But it, it, that, that sort of thing, when you know your clients, or well, you think you know your clients already, you've already done a loan for them, they're coming back for a top up. The assumption is they both want it, but you can't just make that mm. assumption. Mm. In our uh, business that we ran, or run, eight years ago we uh, used the um, an accounting system called Myop, right? Anyway, prior to that, I've been in loans for many years for people who were producing Myop pastries and I didn't know they were from Myop, right? Anyway, it certainly opened our eyes to the ability to fraudulently do those documents, okay? Which previously I had no idea about, okay? Recently, uh, we want to go paper free now, uh, business now, uh, and we've invested in the Adobe Reader, it's only a four or five hundred dollar software package. You can actually alter any single document that you receive. The whole idea of it is to delete tax file numbers, okay? But again, it's opened the eyes to how easy it is to forward any document. In fact, it's simple. I know a particular bank that's actually working on it. They've got some uh, technology and software from they use in the eastern states, and uh, it's actually so when it's going to eventually come through in the next year or so, it's going to actually have um, recognition of the documents going through, so you can actually pick up a fraudulent uh, payslip and stuff like that. And it's very tricky. They put it through their compliance guys, and uh, uh, and they're sort of saying, hey, look, we've made the alterations using the same font and stuff, and it's picking it up at, a, at an amazing rate. So. Uh, I think the problem is that, you know, for us brokers, we're all good guys and we're all trusting at the end of the day with the people we've got the interview with and, you know, besides, you know, trying to, you know, we can always improve it, you know, looking at identification and payslips or checking online with the employers and stuff like that there and, and banks don't
statement showing you know the expenses going in and the income going in it's pretty hard for us to do at the moment from what i know much more than that so we're going to have to be relying on lenders i guess to, to invest yeah, that, into that kind of technology that's you know both good points and, and that is that you, you simply can't rely on one item of verification and so that's why you know as banks we look at lots of different areas to complete a picture of, of who the customer is. I think people are committing fraud though, they're getting more advanced and uh, you know that, that seems pretty easy to even think oh, about that you know and um, yeah. you know that that's a worry. Isn't it? I think as well for us though when you've been doing it for so long you can go on gut feel which won't get you very far these days um, but also it's like would I give this person money? Mm. What what would if it's going to come out of my bank account? Am I going to give it to them? Mm. If so the you're basing that on documentation they're providing. But, and that's the thing you've got to go on feel when you've been in it for a long time, and you've got to go on proof. So if you're concerned about the documents or you're concerned about what they're saying, documents look good. They've said something that's not quite right. Mm. You've got to keep going. I think most brokers do operate with good faith. Absolutely. And I think that um, you know I, I, if I think about. The, the, the sus clients over the years that I've come across, and there actually hasn't been that many considering how many years I've been in it. And most of, the, most of them have actually been openly dishonest and are actually filling you out to sort of like say, oh, well, this is my true circumstance, but nevertheless, mm. could we do this? Even the simple act of falsifying income can put you, your career, and your reputation in jeopardy. Pause this video now and have a think about the steps you could put in place that would help you stop from falling victim to fraud. Now that you've identified the steps you'll put in place to identify fraudulent practices, it's time to think about how you would deal with fraud should you have to. When you see someone, you don't, you know they, uh, you don't believe they qualify for the loan they're looking at, so you can't help them. And then uh, a month later you find out, okay, well, and talking to them, oh, well, I went to so-and-so and I got a loan here. I think, okay, well, I don't know how that could happen. <laughs> oh, something must have changed I'm not aware of. And you sort of think to yourself, well, okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. either some circumstances change or you think to yourself, that could only happen if something wasn't disclosed, yeah. maybe. Well, that's right. Do we educate them? And is the broker saying no? And saying, well, you know, this is where the issues are and stuff like that, because I've had that happen to me. Like a, like a think, tenancy. How did you get that across the line? They're like a bad tenants list. We could have, like, the attempted fraudulent client list. Oh, put their name up so you can Yeah, look, look the, 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 the irony in all this is, you know, the privacy law then comes into play mm -hmm. um, and, and protects because, you know, if people aren't found guilty of anything, well, it's, um, they're not guilty of anything. So, you know, it's... I'm, I'm pleased with where the industry is at with with this sort of thing, um, and it's not it's not um, it's not hugely prevalent. Um, it does happen, but brokers are acting in good faith to to look for it, um, as opposed to just being a conduit for it to go through. Now, every now and then, you'll read the MFAA has suspended a broker because um, there is some who will get in the industry and, and exploit their their position. But across the board, the standards are extremely high. And you know the weak spots are reducing more and more. Um, the danger is that as the weak spots reduce, um, as you say, the, the fraudsters are always looking for the next opportunity, and that's life. That's that's business. That's always going to be around. You've got to prove you can afford it, and if I don't think you can afford it, I'm not going to write the loan for you. And the way the taxation department is is trying to collect tax as quickly as possible, or even sending out demand notices for people their tax is not even due yet, and that's starting to happen too. And it's. Mm. It's fair to say though, once you've been in the trade longer, you sort of pick up the signs. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure how the new people would pick up those same signs, it'd be an interesting part of it, definitely. But also the banks take a risk in what information they want. It's like risk versus reward, like for example, each bank's got its different policy on what information is required to go through with an application. So for example, ANZ, you could say, well, they want to see if you refinance the last three months statements of the whatever, but they're not actually asking for the last three months statements of their savings account so you can actually see if their pay is going into their account. It actually matches the pay slip. Do you know what I mean? So you can actually see where the bank itself maybe could open itself up, but then it's also a risk versus it's yeah, a cost. It's always, it's always, 
balance. It's a bit like when I started the bank. So they used to check every single check that went through under a thousand dollars. I remember as the ledger examiner. But then I'd better not say what it is now because it's probably quite astonishing. I think the biggest um, change we've had as a result of the NCCP and compliance is our, the onus on us for reasonable inquiry. Yeah. And I'm always imparting that to, to our guys is that reasonable inquiry, did you ask this, did you ask that, did you ask them to prove that? Um, our job is not to put someone in an untenable position. So have they got insurance? Do they have income protection? And, and I won't mm. accept yes and the amount, they have to prove it, they have to have it on the file to show that they've got insurance, to show that they've got income protection. Because it's very, you know, brokers are inherently lazy. If we don't have to get a form, we won't. You know what I mean? So they, they have to, they've got to put it in the file and, and they have to make reasonable inquiry. Why are you being refined? Why do you want to refinance? What have you got at the moment? Can we prove that, you know, it's a better situation for you? All those things that we didn't have to do before. We could just accept someone wanted to refinance. Now we have to make that reasonable inquiry. As you can see, different brokers handle fraud differently. Some will choose to be blunt with their clients, while others will take a more subtle approach. Pause this video now and think about how you'll handle your fraudulent clients. By now, you probably realise just how important it is to make compliance part of your process. The more integrated compliance management is in your business, the better you'll be. So with that in mind, it's time to take what you have learned and implement it into your business today. Good luck.